Hello, everyone, and thank you again for joining our virtual symposium today. Um, I want to say um, appreciation to our speakers who are going to be joining us in this next session, uh, Critical Incidents, Important Lessons for After Action Reviews. Um, as I introduced myself earlier, I'm Vivian Elliott. I'm co-director for our CNA Center for Justice, Research, and Innovation. Um, and just bear with me, I'm just going to go through a few helpful reminders and tips in case we have new folks that have joined us uh, since we have begun. So please uh, keep your phones and computer audio on mute um, to avoid any background noise. This session is being recorded so that you and others can view it uh, at a later time on our website. Uh, we will take questions uh, from our panelists at the end of the conversation. Uh, you can put those in um, the chat at any time during um, the dialogue, as well as at the end when we take Q&A. Uh, please edit your display name by hovering over your name, clicking more, choosing the rename option, and changing your screen name to reflect your full name in agency or organization. And then as a reminder, um, the points of view and opinions expressed here out um, from our panelists uh, do not um, reflect the official position or policy of DOJ or our other clients. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Don Thomas, who's the director of CNA Center for Critical Incident Analysis to begin our session today. Thank you, Don. Thanks, Vivian. Hi, everybody. It's so nice to have you here. Um, what a great job the JRI team is doing, um, and we're really happy to be here. Um, I'm Dawn Thomas. So currently at CNA, I am director of the Center for Critical Incident Analysis, and I co-direct the Center for um, Emergency Management and Operations. As you can imagine, there's a lot of overlap between those um, centers, but also um, the Center for Critical Incident Analysis kind of hovers over all the other centers in that we all do critical incident analysis on our different topics. So um, I do want to say I've been at CNA for 20 years, um, which is a very long time. Um, and I've seen a lot kind of in the field of critical incident analysis. And kind of what I've come to, um, to believe about this topic is that, um, you know, we as humans and society, society have a kind of constant ability to, um, to learn, right? And um, when the worst happens, we can treat that as um, the tragedy that it is while still learning from it and getting better with our responses as a result. So um, with that, I want to introduce the rest of our panel. You'll hear from them all soon. Um, first, Carrie Shelton. Um, she has over 15 years of experience conducting critical incident analyses. She's done it for Homeland Security, emergency management, public health, and justice. Um, and she's also led meta analyses um, of after action reports, which I'm sure she'll talk about today. Uh, Tammy Felix is a senior research scientist with JRI, also been working at CNA for over 20 years, um, working on the justice system, providing critical incident analysis training and TTA. Um, and supporting organizational reform um, in agencies and jurisdictions across the U.S. And finally, last but not least, we have Jeff Smith. He's a senior advisor and a retired public safety director with 26 years of experience, um, has been involved in multiple AARs during his career, both from the process of conducting them, but also um, in, uh, in implementing the improvements that came out of them. So great panel we have here today, um, and I'm super excited to ask some questions. However, I do want to level set a little bit um, about critical incident analysis processes and kind of the best practices we found over the years for doing them. So next slide, please. OK, so a little bit of time to brag. As I said, I've been here for 20 years um, and that um, we've been doing critical incident analysis um, for, uh, for all of those years, starting um, right before I came. So um, we have conducted over 20, uh, over 95 real world critical incident analyses since 2002. Um, 25, more than 25 of those have been specifically in public safety between 2004, 2024. Um, and more than 60 of them have been in other topics such as infectious disease, extreme weather, wildfires, um, things like that. 
Um, I do want to say that our record for conducting uh, AARs in one year is 26. As you can imagine, it was 2022 and it was COVID, plus all the other things that happen in the world, um, even when a pandemic is going on. Um, and then I want to say 42 states, we have done um, critical incident analyses. And um, you better believe those other eight states are where I plan to retire because apparently nothing big happens there. So um, with that said, next slide. All right, so what's your approach to a critical incident analysis? I'll share our approach, although I've kind of um, molded it a little bit to be more um, general for you to use as well. So we think of it as being adapt, right? So first is adaptable. You're going to have to change your approach depending on what type of incident you have, who's going to be um, part of it, how much time you have, how much funding you have, and what your requirement really is for this after action effort. Um, next, data driven, right? There's qualitative and quantitative data in every after action review and kind of understanding what those different types of data that you can use and how to use them is something that our panelists will talk about today. And I hope we get to talk about more um, when we have the Q&A session. Experts use the people who know what they're talking about, right? One of the biggest places we get to in an after action review is that we have findings, right? And we're looking for how do you improve? Well, if you're not using experts to figure out kind of how you can operationalize those improvements, you're probably gonna get to an after action review that's gonna sit on a shelf. So you really wanna engage your experts um, in every way possible during this um, process. And then um, process oriented. There's a lot of different processes that you can use. Um, some of them are federally driven, some of them are department or agency driven, but find a process that is um, that works well and that is um, able to uh, incorporate novel techniques and it's applicable to all incident types. Then you can get good at that process um, and you can make sure that you're checking all the boxes. Of course, you're still gonna be adaptable, but it's really nice to have that framework to work around. And then finally, transformational. Look for those corrective actions um, and findings that make a real operational impact on what you do day to day, right? We're looking for continuous improvement, but we're looking for things that really move the ball down the field kind of in the best way possible. So, um, so what do you do? What steps do you take when you go through a critical incident analysis? Well, first you define the scope, right? What's the purpose? What's your objectives? And what do you wanna um, get out of this review for? So that's your scope. Then you go on to um, a kind of back and forth steps, um, collect and analyze, collect data. And we'll talk a lot about the different sources you'll collect it from um, in the next slide and with the panel and then analyze that data. And the reason it goes back and forth is that as you find things out, you're gonna find other things you need to collect data about. So collect, analyze, collect, analyze um, until you feel like you've kind of hit maximum capacity for, for what you want to learn. Sharing them, right? It doesn't work if you don't share it. So what are where? who else needs to know what you know? Um, obviously within your own department or agency, but are there bigger lessons learned that you can share with more of a, a community, um, like your law enforcement cohort? Um, how can you share the results um, in a way that help both your department and agency, but also others that maybe haven't gone through what you just went through? And then finally, act, right? Um, for corrective actions, um, implementing them along a timeline that you set um, with a priority that you set, um, you will not act on every finding in an AAR, and that's okay. In fact, I would even say that's recommended. Um, you want to bring your AAR to your decision makers in your organization and say, okay, which of these things do we want to work on first? Which do we want to work on second? And which are we not going to touch for a variety of reasons? So, um, so that's a process. Um, next slide, I just want to go into a little bit more detail before we, um, yep, so we're going to look at collect, analyze, and share. Okay. So when we talk about collecting data, what are we talking about? So there's incident data, right? There's the activity logs you might have kept, sit reps, situation reports, there's emails, there's video, there's, um, there's all the, the um, data that the incident itself generated, okay? Then there's best practices and lessons learned that you either know of from before, or you find after, or that you've talked about with outside groups, right? How have other people dealt with this before? That's data to collect when you're thinking about your findings. 
um, your current plans, procedures, and policies. Um, you can't say whether you followed your plans unless you incorporate those plans into your after action review. So, um, so make sure that you're gathering kind of any relevant plan to the incident that just occurred. And then stakeholder input is critical and something we'll talk a lot about um, in this session. So that can be in the form of interviews, that could be surveys, that could be workshops, that could be from your internal staff, that can be from the public. That's from a wide range of, um, of stakeholders that you want to hear from about the incident. Um, it's qualitative data but it's really important for context. Um, and there are quantitative things you can do with it to, um, to make sure that you uh, believe in what you're saying, even though it's kind of word of mouth. Next is analyze, right? So you're gonna use qualitative and quantitative techniques. So you're gonna look at root cause analysis, you can look at mixed methods, you can look at triangulation, you can look at um, comparing um, what should have been to what was. Um, there's lots of different methods. They're all very effective, um, you know, one that's most effective for you. Um, this, as I noted, this drives additional data collection because you'll find where you uh, have gaps. And then always remember to validate your data through other sources, right? I did talk about how qualitative data is still data, right? And that input from other folks. But if you heard it from one person and you're hearing something different from others, or if you hear it from someone, but the timeline that you put together doesn't match, always question your data and make sure that you're able to um, validate it in a way that you feel comfortable with. And then finally share, how do you share this information? Um, timelines and reconstructions are excellent for kind of a fact-based um, reconstruction of what happened, right? So it's the what happened, it doesn't get into the why. Um, story maps, you can use GIS if it was a very geographically based, this happened here, this happened there, you can tell it in a, in a story map. Reports, right? Everyone loves good AAR, um, and um, and those are perfectly um, fine tools for getting information across. Um, improvement plans with actionable recommendations um, can always be part of what you do, um, even if you just do a timeline and a reconstruction and then go to improvement plans, right? That's got to be part of it because those actions are critical. And then presentations, right? It's really good. If you do write a report, it's really great to kind of Row the highlight reel into a PowerPoint so that you can easily share it with others. All right, that's the end of all the talking that I'm going to do, which is good because now I get to talk to our awesome panel. Um, so if we could take the slides down and see everybody's faces. Thank you so much. Hi, panel. Nice to see everybody. Okay, so my first question, Carrie, it's for you. Um, it's a it's a multiple part question, so so bear with me. So first of all, like what types of incidents need an AAR? Um, and then once you decide, oh, this needs an AAR, how do you decide what type or level AAR it needs? And then um, like, how do you choose kind of what kind of AAR or presentation or product you need? Walk us through that process. Sure, um, thanks, John. So that, those are really excellent questions. I think, you know, despite the title of this session, Critical Incidents and Important Lessons for After Action Reviews, AARs don't have to just be for critical incidents, right? They can be for any agency response where there's something to learn or maybe something you want to capture that went really well that you want to repeat in future responses. I think the more an agency participates in the After Action Review um, process, it's going to set you up for that, you know, approach to continuous learning and that if a critical incident does arise, you're really prepared better to evaluate that using a methodologically sound approach to conducting AAR. So when, whenever you think it's necessary, <laughs> I think is important. Um, or sometimes when others think it's, think it's necessary too, when they're looking to hear, you know, from your agency, from your jurisdiction about your response to an incident, like that's when you should be doing an AAR. Um, so if you do think you need to do an AAR, like how do you decide, right? What, what was your question, the levels of ARs? So um, similar to incidents, right? You can have minor incidents all the way up to these critical incidents. You can do a very short, brief, quick after action report. We often call them like a quick look report where you're just trying to capture as quickly as possible, like the key things that went either really well, um, key things that need to be changed, get that out as quickly as possible so you can implement improvements within the agency. So you can do that, that quick turn report after action review. Um, you can do a more extensive after action review. So like with 
the COVID response, right? If it's a long duration response, there were lots of different aspects to it, you might want a more in-depth involved after action review process. Um, and then also I think it's important to think about like what your scope is. So do you think a lot of what you learned is really like kind of primarily focused internal to your agency's organizations and maybe you just wanna do an internal AAR. If there are a lot of challenges or successes associated with your interaction with partners in a larger response, then that might require more of a jurisdictional response to an AR. So that could be right at any level, all the way up to like a whole of community, whole of government, all the way down to you could do an after action review on a component of the agency or a component of the response. Um, I think it's really important to identify and be clear about that before you engage in after action review. Otherwise, there will be kind of um, stakeholder expectations about what they think they're getting um, versus what they're actually getting. Um, it also helps you identify, which we'll talk about, I think, a little later, about who you should engage in that in that after action review effort. Um, so you really want to be clear about kind of like what your purpose is, who you're going to engage, um, and kind of what the scope is going to be. Um, and how do you kind of choose which one, right? So I think it depends on what your scope is, what you feel is most important to capture, where were the lessons learned, where were the challenges, um, what's the focus. And then the last thing I think is really important to think about when you're deciding about your after action review, after action report process, is, is this something that your agency or jurisdiction needs to share with the public or not? And knowing that upfront can influence how you approach, who you engage, et cetera, for an after action report. Um, I'm gonna put something in the chat. This is an article about um, a recent after action report associated with the COVID response that didn't go so well. Um, and I think it speaks to being clear like with your stakeholders in advance about what your after action report is gonna cover, what kind of level it's gonna be, um, you know, kind of what you're what you're intending to do with it, so that those expectations are set and clearly established before you know before you engage with it. All right, awesome. Thank you, Carrie. Um, Tammy, can you give us an example um, when you saw a department, agency, and organization kind of decide to do one, and 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 what did they decide to do, and why did they decide to do it that way? Great question, Don. Um, <clears throat> so essentially, you know, I you know, when we're thinking through kind of the questions we wanted to ask ourselves on this panel. Um, it, it, it seemed like there was a bit of a distinction, right? I would say many, if not most, law enforcement agencies kind of typically do after action analyses, uh, you know, when there's kind of a more complex event than a day to day kind of operation. Um, but I think, you know, when you think in, in terms of emergency management, right, like they're a little bit more proactive and kind of always doing after action reports. But I think when it comes, when I thought to back to kind of some of the critical incident analyses and after action reports we've done specifically for law enforcement agencies, you know, those are typically requested of us when it's, you know, essential to have an outside kind of independent third party Kind of, you know, just for the legitimacy of the report and the legitimacy and transparency and accountability of the department to bring in an outside expert or consultant to kind of take an outside look at, you know, what happened, like what, what are the actual issues that need to be pointed out and corrected via training or addressed through policy. Um, I think, you know, it echoes in my mind that every time we do these, you know, I think our approach is more research based, right, and the approach that you detailed at the beginning of this panel, um, you know, we differ, I think, from the way some other firms may do it. You know, we don't look for gotcha moments. We're not doing like a real criminal investigation to figure out like who are the eight people that did something, you know, wrong. We're really looking organizationally to see, you know, what improvements can we make based on the situation that unfolded. So one most recent incident I can think of is the Philadelphia Police Department asked us to come in and take a look at their response to the protests there that after the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis. And Philadelphia will admit, and they admitted it right when they spoke to us, that you know they got caught flat-footed. They didn't think that they were going to see an outpouring of support in, in a in a you know the mission for social justice and the level of demonstrations that were going to happen in the city. And unfortunately 
they didn't have the staff on hand um, to even respond to it. We found out through the analysis that, you know, they didn't, by policy, have any kind of mechanism to even bring or call back in more officers to help, you know, respond to the situation effectively. And I mean, they'll, I don't feel that it's wrong to say that, you know, Philadelphia, you know, the city solicitor's office we work closely with and the Philadelphia Police Department, you know, recognize that a lot of things went wrong in that response, both, you know, decision making wise and operationally. And they had a new commissioner at the time, and I think had been on post for a couple of months when this happened. But, you know, she was really looking anyway to try transform the department. So they really took um gave us our liberty to kind of act independently and just really responded to our requests for information. Um, but through the process, you know, I think we had something like 75 different recommendations for them to implement. And I think I saw a report about a year ago that they had fulfilled about 85% of those. So anyway, I think I maybe got off track a little bit here, but um but yeah, I think we're usually called in, at least in my experience for law enforcement, when, you know, it's critical to the, not only the success of implementing the recommendations, but to building a better bridge to the community and trying to repair the damage that was done due to, you know, some of these responses or kind of big unplanned incidents. Um, I think it's, you know, imperative that you have independent you know, contractor or experts that are able to provide that level of detail and, and again, recommendations for how to improve. Hey, thanks, Tammy. Mm -hmm. All right, Jeff, you are, um, you were a practitioner for a very long time. So I'd like to ask you, um, why would you want to do an AAR when you were directing public safety? Like, what were the benefits to you of doing one? Sure. Well, I think, you know, the obvious answer is lessons learned, you know, and how to be better prepared or equipped for the future and things like that. But, you know, going a little bit deeper than just that surface layer, you know, it it's all these different things that you can get out of it. And, you know, it, Tammy mentioned it, and it's really important that with an AAR, you know, it's, it's a learning opportunity. It's not just that gotcha. You know, there can be aspects of maybe some things that didn't go all that well, but overall, it's, you know, what is it that happened? Um, and is it things that we can either improve on, um, change, need to, um, and also the things that went really well? So it, it's got that wide scope. Um, and yeah, there are those things that sometimes pop up that is just like, well, we did it this way, but, you know, in the future, let's change that so that it's better into the future. Um, so, you know, it's deeper than just that surface lessons learned and that sort of thing. And then, you know, oftentimes it can then translate into helping you as you're trying to move forward, you know, as an example, it may be an improvement in technology. So maybe you've been arguing or having the discussions that, you know, you've got some sort of, let's say, camera system, and it's not all that great. But yet, now this incident happens. And as part of this AR, you know, it's kind of determined, yeah, you know, it would have been a lot better for real time and that sort of thing if these were integrated, et cetera, you know, making it up a hypothetical here. But later then that'll help with some of that justification. And, you know, now it's not only just you saying this, but you've got a little bit of backing then also that just shows that, yeah, that that definitely would. So, you know, it could help then with maybe a prolonged capital improvement project, budget increase, that sort of thing. You know, another one, too, um, if, if you know, we kind of stay with the bigger events um, and the larger um, scale things that, you know, typically with law enforcement that will do an AAR on, you know, a lot of times it's transparency stuff um, and trying to, you know, show that what happened to the public, um, to everyone else, you know, and that we have someone come in, take a look at it. And then here are the results, here are the things. And, you know, I think we'll get into it a little bit later on, you know, how do we share that and that sort of thing. Because you got to be careful with some things when it comes to, you know, tactical considerations and things like that. But the overall, you know, showing that transparency, especially on the bigger stuff, because everyone wants to know, you know, what, what happened, how did it go? Um, and then there's also that level, do, you know, do people feel safe? Do they feel like there are those things that, 
I, I think it was earlier, um, and I can't remember who said it, but unfortunately, when it happens again, instead of the if it happens again, um, kind of giving some of that reassurance um, to that with that. So, you know, and, and then the other thing uh, along with that is just really, it's one of the benefits with the AR is that, that transparency piece, the communication mm -hmm. piece, uh, and then being able to make sure that you take those um, findings and, you know, basically implement them as much as you can um, across the board. And sometimes it's a short term, you can do them quickly. And sometimes you have to plan them out longer, whether it's uh, a fiscal issue or, you know, personnel, things like that. So, you know, just taking those and trying to implement them as you can. Awesome. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I'm going to pull up Mr. Rogers for like the people of my generation that know what I'm referring to. <laughs> um, okay. So my next question is, um, Tammy, so I know you've done a bunch of law enforcement specific and public safety um, critical incident analyses. Um, who, who asked them for you, right? And then who oversaw the effort as you were going through and doing them? Again, Don, that is a tricky one. Um, I just wanted to quickly, because it does kind of answer this question as well, like capitalize on what Jeff had just mentioned that, you know, a lot of times there is an opportunity to point out all the things that went well. So one thing I immediately thought of is, you know, back in 2012, uh, the Bureau of Justice Assistance asked us to work with the City of Charlotte Police Department and Tampa Police Department as the host for the presidential nominating conventions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as part of that, you get a lot of federal funding to support all the activities that are going to happen. You know, I think planning boots on the ground starts like two months before these events are actually held. So BJA recognized that as a real opportunity to, you know, get some researchers out there to figure out like what are Charlotte and Tampa employing? What are they doing? How are they preparing? And let's capture that and document it so that other departments can benefit from, okay, Perhaps they're not going to host a nominating convention, but they're certainly going to see some big events in their jurisdiction, right? So there's lots of lessons learned and lots of things that, you know, Charlotte and Tampa developed during that process that I'm sure have proven useful to people. I know that two of the folks that were, um, you know, leaders in the Charlotte Police Department were out in Chicago um, for in advance of the Democratic National Convention there just a few weeks ago. Um, and that went really well, so I can only assume that all their you know, benefit from that. But we worked with both Tampa and Charlotte. We did an after action report on their kind of preparation and response to the events there, which both really went very well. Um, there weren't a lot of issues, but there were a lot of lessons learned from it. And then we documented those into a planning primer um, for how other jurisdictions can handle large scale special security events. Um, I will find the link. I know I put it somewhere, but to put it in the chat for everybody, if you want to take a look at that. Um, but getting to your specific question um, about who oversees it, I mean, you know, for the planning primer, we really were working with BJA and the local police departments, right, for their individual after action reports. But again, I, I feel like, you know, no matter what after action report or critical incident analyses I've worked on, you know, we're usually largely in it the, you know, the hosts or the, you know, the, the agency or jurisdiction we're working with likes the fact that they can say, you know, I'd like to have an update, but they're clear on they don't want to provide their bias or their input into it. It's very important to them as well that this is independent. I mean, they'll help us get information that we need, you know, and, and you often have to have discussions about, well, you know, we can take it this far in terms of what we're identifying as issues, right? Or or where we can drive this towards identifying areas for improvement. But if we don't get certain pieces of information or certain data back, you know, that's going to impact what we're able to say, which we're always pretty good about making sure that we're clear about what we had access to and how we manipulated and use that data to come up with our um, findings and recommendations. So I think I somewhere in there answered your question, Don, but it, I guess the point is, is that there's somebody that asks us to come out and help them, but both from our side and from their side, it, you know, it's, we work together on the process of getting the things we need to do the analysis that we need to do, not necessarily them trying to tell us, you know, what the issues are beforehand. So we've, yeah. I, I guess we've been lucky that <laughs> we've had that kind of mutual support. 
You know, no, that's great, um, Tammy. And it like makes me think of a question that I'll ask uh, Jeff as our practitioner. Um, have you seen kind of who asks for and who oversees the AAR process kind of influence either negatively or positively the way that the eventual AAR came out? Yeah, yeah. Short answer is yes, um, but you know, not that I, none that I'm really going to call it by name. But what uh, I think I would, you know, the best way to answer that is just I've seen some that have not gone well, um, just for the simple fact that they were, were led with like preconceived notions or they had preconceived outcomes that they wanted um, going into it, and that could have been a third party or it could have been. Uh, I'll call it internal just for the sake, you know, that it was still part of the same organization, maybe an outlier, but still, but, but they had those preconceived notions or outcomes and, you know, you have to go into these unbiased, you know, it's, mm -hmm. you, you talked earlier about what is it, what is that scope? Um, and is that scope appropriate? And then, you know, moving forward and then letting that collection of an analysis and all of that play out into your, you know, that final product, if you will. So it, it's really important that you don't do that. Um, so I've seen some go really horribly wrong because of that. Um, I've seen some negative ones um, because of, I, I mentioned before, lack of communication. You know, we really try to, I don't want to say pride ourselves in law enforcement and say we communicate really well with whether it's uh, other agencies or you know, uh, other departments within that jurisdiction. But a lot of times the left hand doesn't really know the, what the right hand is doing. And, you know, a specific example is, especially if a large size city, large size jurisdiction, you know, if, if, if it's like the mayor's office or something like that is now wanting to do this, but they haven't communicated anything to the police department. And now all of a sudden it's been bid out. It's, you know, the, the company's been hired and now these people show up saying, oh, we're here to do this AAR of example, a critical incident that, you know, you had all this major stuff going on, you're, you're immediately into a defensive position. Mm -hmm. You're going to probably have issues with getting the data um, or at least some roadblocks and things like that. So I've seen those go um, poorly when that's occurred too. The positive ones, the ones that I've seen that have gone really well, They've been very transparent. Um, there's a lot of cooperation. Um, and, you know, I'm trying not to get too much into the large scale versus a small event, but, you know, typically the better ones are by an unbiased third party. So somebody outside of the, the jurisdiction, that organization. Um, and then, you know, it, some considerations with that, that also, whether it goes well or uh well or bad negatively, you know, if you're if you're going to do this AR and then you're going to release some of that publicly, you know, a lot of times if you are doing it yourself or it's somehow tied into your organization as being part of it, you know, a lot of times for the public that it seems biased right out of the gate um, because it's you know you hear the expression cops um, policing cops or something along that line. So you know it really can be helpful. And reflecting back on the positive ones versus the negative ones, you know, I will say the ones I've been involved with, previous career, uh, you know, in law enforcement and, the, you know, with CNA, um, and I, I know it's who I work for, but I, I will say, you know, everyone I've been involved in, we go in with no none of those preconceived notions, none of those... Um, preconceived outcomes. And so my my thing would just be when you're talking about the positive or negatives, making sure that you're doing your due diligence from the offset when you're basically selecting who's going to be coming and doing that AAR. And, you know, asking the questions, check with references, check with the the, the companies, the jurisdictions, the places that have done a, that, that company has done AARs before and find out what it is uh, and how they did that. Um, that will also uh, help with making sure that you're getting uh, AAR that's going to have that positive um, ending instead of a negative. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Uh, you know, I'll add one more. So um, uh, I also work um, sometimes with the military, right? 
And I want to add one more to kind of what sets you up for a, for a good AAR effort is a culture of after action review and of continuous improvement, yeah. right? When you're um, with the military and they have um, a training exercise or they just have an operation, they always sit afterwards. And I would consider this a hot wash. This is still part of the AAR process, right? It's just a quick, simple one. But they always sit and they say, well, what went wrong? What could we do better next time? Right. It's a culture of it. And I think as a result, when you when something bigger happens and you go in to start an after action, that culture is already there. So it's very easy to kind of pick up on that and leader from the top down, right, from leadership. It's like, yeah, we're going to learn from everything we do. So that's another thing I've noticed that really influences kind of how it all goes. Um, Carrie, I'm going to go to you, who um, I um, often think of you, Carrie, as mistress of data. Um, so this is a good question for you. Um, who should be engaged in the AAR and, um, and what kind of data are you collecting from them? Yeah, so kind of as I mentioned earlier, I think who you should engage really depends on the focus and scope of the after action review. So are you looking at just a component of the agency or is it going all the way to the whole community response, right? That's going to help inform your stakeholders. Um, and really, you want to engage all the individuals and groups that really can help provide context to a response, right? That they can help identify like the root cause of an issue that they can help, you know, get you the data you need to say, reconstruct the timeline for an event. Um, you also want to think about who's going to help you identify recommendations for the organization. So we always walk into AARs with subject matter expertise, right, in, in policing and emergency response, et cetera. But those in your organization and your jurisdiction know it best. They know what you've already tried. Um, they know the limitations of the legislation, et cetera. So you also want to involve those that can help offer suggestions for improvement, even if they weren't involved in the response. So say, for example, you know, your law enforcement agency is really hamstrung by a certain legislation and you want to propose modifying that legislation. Well, before you put that recommendation in an after action report, you might want to speak with a legislature to say, is this really feasible? How would you phrase this? And you want to leave that organization or jurisdiction with a recommendation that really is actionable that they can take and do something with. So sometimes it does involve people that weren't involved in the response, <laughs> if they can help inform context and offer suggestions for improvement. Um, and also think you need to really be purposeful in your engagement. So sometimes like those stakeholders, even if they don't meet the criteria for engagement, sometimes it's really important to engage them anyway. Um, and often the community falls into this bucket. Um, to provide them an opportunity for input. So to help them help them feel like their voice was heard. Maybe it's not input into the actual contents of the AAR, but the recommendations or a review of the AAR so they know it's coming. All of that, like you know, bringing them into the process can really help with buy-in for the end product, for the recommendations that come out of it. Um, so I think that's also really important to consideration consider. And then when you're engaging these different stakeholder groups or communities, et cetera, they may require different ways to get the data from them, get the information, get their feedback, et cetera. So you want to think about also like back to your um, kind of overview about like engagement approaches, right? Is it best to interview them? Is it best to engage a um, kind of subset of the organization in a focus group? Like, so say your planning section, something went really well with them um, and you want to talk to the planning section, but you don't want to do eight interviews where you talk about the same thing over and over again. <laughs> it might be best to bring them all together in a focus group so that they can provide feedback, feed off of each other, help really kind of, you know, get all of that information and data in kind of a, in a way that's best use of their time, et cetera. Um, you can also use surveys. You can have a facilitated or mediated group discussion where you have an expert facilitator come and ask questions. Um, you can do hot washes. So there's lots of different ways to get the data. And I think you need to be thoughtful of What's the best approach for that individual stakeholder or group of stakeholders? Um, I think you also need to be really thoughtful in who you engage about whether or not, like if you're, especially if you're talking about a critical incident, if your engagement of that stakeholder or stakeholder group could in any way cause trauma. So if it's reliving a critical incident, um, if it's uh, either from you know a responder's perspective or a survivor's perspective, in terms of your approach, that's got to be different and you have to be sensitive about that. So you want to ask yourself questions like, do you need to include a mental health specialist 
within your outreach? Is it absolutely necessary that you talk to this stakeholder or could their um, supervisor provide, for example, the same information without you know, causing trauma to the individuals that you need to talk to? Uh, I think it's also important to think about like level of effort, like how much effort is gonna be required to engage all these stakeholders, prioritize them in terms of engagement because it's really important to like get the findings out there, um, get your recommendations out there. Don't take two years to go through this abstraction process um, because then it seems like fairly worthless. Once you take too long to get the results out, then it kind of becomes a moot point. So getting stuff out sometimes is better than perfectly documented. So you also need to prioritize your stakeholders. All right, thanks, Carrie. Um, I, I'll just add one thing um, with the public. Man, the public, it's, it's tricky, right? So like you can have um, when the public, uh, you just can't get anybody to respond um, to whatever you put out. Um, you can have lots of response. And I, I have to say, um, like as an analyst, like you have to be aware of data biases. People who respond to surveys um, have strong feelings <laughs> one way or the other. Um, so one survey we put out to kind of get the public reaction to an incident, a very big incident that happened somewhere. Um, very, very, very happy with the response and with the jurisdiction or very, very negative about that jurisdiction. And I learned a lot of new um, curse words. Um, so just be aware that even though getting um, information from the public is really critical. You just have to do it carefully and you have to understand how best to use the data that you get. Um, you know, a workshop with the public is a great way to get information from people, but also can turn um, pretty ugly pretty quickly. So you have to be very thoughtful about when you use that and if you want to use that. So I just want to add those points. Um, okay, so how do organizations ensure they're using the AAR to learn and to improve. And I'm basically gonna ask all of our panelists this in different ways. So Carrie, why don't you start us out? Um, how, do you, how do you see organizations ensuring that they get better once they do an AAR? Sure, I think, um, well, first of all, doing one, right? You can't go anywhere if you don't start. So I think just the, the approach to and commitment to engaging in an after action report is the first step, right? But then to kind of continue that, you need to have that, you know, you need to have leadership buy-in. You need to have that, you know, mental approach to continuous improvement and you need to have ownership of it. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, you, especially coming from, you know, an independent unbiased organization coming in and doing after actions for other individuals, we have to have somebody to pass that off to, to say like, yes, this entity is gonna be responsible for implementing the recommendations, right? So you have to have that within your, your organization. Um, you have to have somebody that, you know, whether they were leading the response or they're maybe part of the training and exercise division, you have to have somebody that's gonna say, okay, I take responsibility for this. I'm gonna help figure out how the agency is gonna run with these recommendations. And then have that be that standard approach that you use, you know, kind of every time. Um, two other points to kind of making sure the agency is is moving forward with using after actions for continuous improvement is just kind of have a learning approach to everything, right? Somebody that's always looking at best practices, somebody that's looking at other agencies after actions. So if they hear of an incident that went really well, well, let me see if I can find an after action report from that agency to see how they did that response so well, or maybe it was really bad, right? And then things like... Um, looking to research, uh, like, as you mentioned at the beginning, you know, we've got a couple of meta analyses of after actions that are looking for best practices, right? It's another way to find best practices um, and common challenges across the various um, incidents that occur, occur across the nation and figuring out kind of what are the commonalities and challenges. And so it's a great way to kind of use those after actions to inform program improvements, right? And having that be part of your organization's culture and approach. Yeah, you know, Tammy, Carrie just mentioned kind of learning from others. Have you seen that happen where people used other people's after action processes to learn? I absolutely. But one quick point I want to make um, <clears throat> coming off of what Carrie was just um, talking about and, you know, how do we ensure that the recommendations we make are, are implemented, right? And, you know, I think a lot of especially law enforcement agencies come to us because, you know, 
they are having issues with engaging their community. And I go back to the one of the pillars of 21st century policing and this co-production of public safety, right? Like we can go, the police department can be committed to having an outside person come in and kind of point out the issues they need to resolve or work on or improve on. But it's up to the community as well to know that these reports exist and to know that there's, you know, somebody else pointing out these issues that need to be taken care of. And it's kind of up to them to make sure that these entities are actually implementing them. Um, I think it's, you know, I, to what Carrie said, like, <clears throat> it'd be great if they would assign it to somebody right then, right there. And I know, like, for FEMA work that we do and kind of emergency management, like, we leave there knowing exactly who's responsible for it, their email address and everything. You know, maybe law enforcement will get there, and I hope that they will. But again, I kind of feel like, like, you know, Don, as you said, like, we've we've seen kind of this critical incident analysis and action, after action reporting kind of evolve, right, in the last 20 years, I think. Mm -hmm you know, while law enforcement was probably doing it, it's become more of a public thing that they're doing and sharing it with the community. Um, so luckily, you know, our uh, federal government is recognizing that there is more information out there, right? So, you know, the COPS office um, actually back in January issued their report on their critical incident review of the school shooting at Robb Elementary in Uvalde, Texas. Um, and, you know, they, 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 the report they put out is a really comprehensive, just it, it's a really well-written report um, that covers, you know, kind of seven core capabilities in responding to mass violence. Um, one really great section in there that I, I feel like has been kind of lacking all along is that trauma-informed approach, right? Like not only to like planning, but response and the recovery piece, right? And in dealing with law enforcement and those that were affected by the by the tragedy. Um, so they issued this report and then the cops office, <clears throat> you know, decided that, you know, there's a lot of great lessons learned here that aren't just specific to Uvalde, right? It's, these are help, this is helpful information to law enforcement kind of nationally um, in responding to any sort of mass violence incidents. So they've asked us to take their report and we're creating now and we're hoping it'll be ready in a, in a few months. Um, but it's basically an assessment tool that that agencies can use to assess their capacity and their, you know, capabilities for responding to mass violence. You know, a lot of questions like through planning and like, have you thought of this? Are you prepared for this? Like, it will walk them through. And then at the end of that, they'll get, you know, kind of where they stand or a rating on, you know, their current capacity. And then they'll be linked to resources and, and, and improvements that can be made that, you know, were really put together in the Uvalde report, but will benefit them um, in moving forward and being better prepared. And, you know, hopefully no one ever has to respond to an incident like this again. But I mean, as we saw yesterday, unfortunately, this is something that more and more departments have to be prepared for. But again, in preparing for kind of like the, you know, a, the most tragic thing that can happen, you're also preparing yourself for kind of every, you know, day-to-day -day operations. So we're excited to be working on that. And then um, there's a, no one other one, and I'll be quick, um, that Carrie actually led a meta-analysis um, on publicly available after-action reports around kind of responding to First Amendment protected demonstrations. So through our PSP program, um, Carrie conducted that analysis, and then we created a checklist of sorts for, for law enforcement to be better prepared for responding to those types of incidents. Um, I, that is somewhere in the pipeline to be publicly available. Um, but again, it was based on doing an analysis of kind of all the lessons learned and really figuring out like, okay, here are the things you need to be thinking about and you need to be able to say, yes, I'm doing this. And yes, I've developed plans or policies or implemented training for that. All right. Thanks, Tammy. All right, Jeff. Can, do you have an example of when you saw an, uh, a finding from an AAR implemented? I do, um, but I, I think I want to. I'm going to change what I was going to talk about. Tammy, you know, just brought up an interesting point. Um, so, and I, I'll make it brief, but example of law enforcement um, either making changes based on somebody else's AAR. So years ago, um, one of the things that came out, and I, I, unfortunately, there's been way too many school shootings. Um, one of them was just talking about you know, trying to have more um, officers, whether it was school resource officers or officers around. And I remember reading that 
uh, one agency was parking squad cars um, randomly at the day at different schools, um, whether there was an officer there or not, right? To give the appearance so that no one knew. I took it, ran with it a little bit and decided, you know what, we're going to change this. So day shift or, you know, policy became that um, and short of them being tied up with some kind of critical incident, officer was going to walk through each one of the schools in our district, uh, ran, you know, didn't matter what time of the day, just pick a school, make sure every one of them in the district. So they were there, they would do a walkthrough if there wasn't a school resource officer at that building. Um, and so something like that. So it was still back to, you know, you'd like to have officers and, you know, from that AAR, from whatever incident that was with the squad cars parked out, kind of took it another step farther and, you know, tried to then change it up a little bit and still put more presence in there. So it, that that was something that was implemented from an AAR from another agency, but that was somewhat reflected in our own jurisdiction and something that we could kind of run with a little bit. Oh, that's a great one. Thanks, Jeff. Um, okay, Carrie, I'm going to go back to you to speak to what resources are available. For, we've talked a lot about how a neutral third party can help you. Um, obviously, we are a neutral third party, and so and that's our experience is helping others, right? But organizations can also do their own after action reports, especially for those smaller incidents that they that are, you know are learning opportunities that they don't want to let go. But it doesn't really rise to kind of maybe the public needing to know uh, um, details or it's it's just it's not a critical incident. It's just an important incident. So, Carrie, can you walk us through some tools um, that you know of and that you've used that can help an organization do their own after action report? Sure, absolutely. So I think the the first one I'm going to highlight is is primarily specific for law enforcement. It's really tailored to law enforcement. So there is a um, cops office guide how to conduct an after action review. I'll put it in the chat. Um, but I'm going to put these all in the chat for you, Carrie. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, it provides a great overview, um, especially from the law enforcement perspective, about how your agency can conduct an after action review and have that continuous improvement process. Um, that is kind of modeled on and consistent with. FEMA's approach to after actions. Um, and FEMA is a great resource for both after actions for um, critical incidents, but especially for exercises as well. So FEMA has an after action report user guide um, that can that has a lot of the same information as the COPS guide, but those are two real great uh, guides um, that can help your agency you know, conduct AARs. There's also other things like templates, technical assistance training. Um, so team FEMA also has a template <clears throat> um, and it kind of basically breaks down all the contents of the AR. Um, so you can use that as well. Um, it's also, I mean, that, that same template can be used for after actions, for critical incidents, for any response, um, but for exercise. And I, I did mention this earlier, but I think one way to help your agency get into that continuous improvement process is to do the AARs for exercises in the same way in which you do the AARs for critical incidents, right? So that's all looped into one continuous improvement process is both exercises and the real world events. Um, there's a couple of technical assistance resources. So the COPS office has a collaborative reform initiative that offers um, technical assistance to agencies for um, doing an AR for a critical incident. So they can actually come, um, you can you know, ask them for help and they can come in and help your agency conduct an after action report on critical incident. And we've done that for a number of years. Um, some of the AARs TM you mentioned were through that, were through that program. Um, FEMA also has a continuous improvement technical assistance program. It's called the, the SITAP. Um, through their continuous improvement organization, they support that. There's lots of technical assistance resources available on, they have a preparedness toolkit on their website um, for, um, for AARs. And then this one's not specific to uh, critical incidents or real world incidents, but FEMA has their national exercise division, and you can ask for support in conducting an exercise um, through, through NED, through their national exercise division. Um, so that's another way to kind of get free resources to help you do AARs. Um, there's also some online training, the Emergency Management Institute, which is being renamed shortly, and I don't remember the new name, but it's FEMA's training group. Um, they have a couple courses on 
Uh, most of them are exercise focused, but they have they do have one on continuous improvement that's really helpful um, as well. And then, you know, our website from the Critical Incident Analysis Center has a lot of uh, examples that you can use as well to kind of like um, see what other agencies are doing, um, some best practices in the field, et cetera. So there's lots of stuff out there. Um, it might be a little bit overwhelming, but definitely start with the COPS guides and, and the FEMA templates. Those can be a really great place to get started. All right. And I did not pay Carrie to give a shout out to my center's um, landing page, um, but thank you. Um, okay. So that is um, it for our formal questions. I want to do one quick little thought exercise with everybody, and then we're going to go to questions from the group. Um, so the theme of this um, conference is kind of about the future, right? The, um, the future of, of all the topics that we're talking about. So um, we put into a large language model to ask what the future of, um, of AARs and law enforcement might look like, and we got answers. And as everything I've ever done with a large language model, it's a great start, <laughs> but I tweaked it. Um, uh, because, um, because it wasn't, it wasn't always a, exactly on, but I did use their categories. Okay. So, um, analyze the use or lack of use is my, um, additive of data in decision-making, right? So like to, I, we think that like, you know, 10 years down the future, when you're looking at an after action, how you use the data that you had available, or how you didn't use the data you had available? And are there gaps in the data that you have available that would have actually really impacted the way that you responded and maybe acting on those gaps? So, that, so that's one. There should be a more data-rich environment and you should be able to see kind of how that data, data was or was not used during your critical incident response. The second is better, more real-time feedback. So um, you shouldn't need to wait <laughs> to gather all this information from lots of different sources. Um, you should um, have a lot of uh, real-time feedback, um, what that looks like, whether it's in the palm of your hand or someday in your glasses that you're looking out of, kind of RoboCop style, you know, I don't know. But, but we should have more data available to us real-time so that, that you can almost institute the after-action process when it's not after yet, right? So it's more real time. Another one that they gave me was interagency collaboration. This is as old as time. Um, so I think it's really funny that it spit back that this is the future too, right? Um, the things are, the way I think about that one is that like incidents are getting more complex, right? The complexity of society these days, right? The complexity of jurisdictions, the complexity of the the issues that we're dealing with, right? They're, it's all more complex. And the idea of um, uh, being able to do kind of those big critical incident analyses just internally, you should do it internally, but you're also going to need to look outward and kind of see how the different pieces and parts work together. That's 50 years ago. I know that will be 50 years from now. Um, community involvement and transparency, right? We live in a society where everybody has a little computer in their hand and can get the latest and the greatest whenever they want. And so I think that's absolutely correct that um, that critical incident analyses will have to engage the public um, and the results from those um, incident analyses will need to be made public as well to kind of feed that need for people who that's how they live is kind of on social media or just kind of in the virtual world and are expecting that information and that transparency because it's kind of embedded in everything they do now. Uh, continuous improvement and learning. Um, thank you, AI, for that. Yes, <laughs> um, we should absolutely continue to think of it as a process and not a like one and done, right? If something doesn't happen, we do an AR and then we're done. It's that culture, right? So it's that continuous improvement that we always stop and think about what could have gone better. Um, uh, you know, you could have a phone call with your with your team and and do a little after action review like, oh, did I get all the information from them I wanted? Why not? What, what did I you know, what could I do better next time? Right. That continuous uh, improvement mentality will, will really serve us in the future. 
Um, emphasis on mental health and wellness. Yeah, I thought this was spot on, right? As uh, Tammy and both and Carrie both um, alluded to, right? The understanding of trauma and how it impacts on um, both the responders and the victims and the survivors, right? Every group is going to be um, impacted by that trauma and after action reviews are going to have to take into account that mental health and wellness. And then when I think AI miss, which I'm super excited when I think I'm smarter than AI, but um, uh, they didn't talk about data visualization. I, I hope <laughs> that um, as we advance in the technology and the data that we have available to us, that the ways that we're going to be able to show you kind of that, that timeline of what happened and that reconstruction get better and better. Um, and there's more and more learning just because we're able to visualize it better. And I think this is critical with our leaderships, right? Everyone has a boss, right? So when you're trying to explain what happened and why, the more visual um, and the more engrossing it is, you're going to get more um, kind of effort on that other end. So I do see that improving and I do see it as a really big step forward for, um, for the industry of doing after action reports. So um, I, there was one question earlier that um, Carrie mostly answered, but I am gonna comment on a little bit from Kim. Um, and then I will, um, and then I'll move to the new question about the role AI will play um, in after action reports. And I can't wait to tell you my thoughts and get others on our panels. But, um, but, but as to implementing after actions, I do wanna repeat something I said in the beginning, because I think it's super important you might get handed an after action report with 75 recommendations. You do not, success is not necessarily acting on 75 recommendations. Um, success is determining kind of what has the biggest impact for a cost that you can bear um, and then getting buy-in from everyone around you that these are the things we're gonna at least work on first. Those other 65 might come later, but that, um, I think whittling down the like, if we just did this one thing, things would be better. That's success in my book. So one of the ways you can make sure it doesn't sit on the shelf, I think, is um, is really prioritizing what is most important to change the outcomes of the operations and then just focus on those. Those other things, yeah, they'd be great to do, but maybe you don't have the funding or the time or the focus. So that's one of the things I'll say. And then AI, the role of AI in, um, in critical incident analysis. Um, I have deep thoughts about this one, but I'm going to go to Tammy and Jeff and Carrie first and see if anybody, what role will AI play in the developing future after, um, ac after action reports in the future of them? Well, I'll jump in right out of the gate and steal the easy part, probably. I mean, we we're, we already see all these areas that AI is, you know, starting. I don't want to even call it creep anymore. It's just it's starting to become integrated. And, you know, data analysis alone in the future, right? I mean, we we've always talked about with technology and integration of different systems and things like that, but just the possibility I'm thinking of the speed um, of AI when it just comes in, uh, I'll make my answer quick on this. What I will say the basics of data analysis, or at least when you're grabbing it from that, when you're starting that AAR and you're getting in there and you're asking for all this data to come in, and then all of a sudden you've got an AI already built that just grabs it and then compiles it for you. And maybe even it's already there, gone, and it's now it's this visual representation as well, compared to what we do now. Uh, I think that's that that point alone is going to be huge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. Tammy, Carrie, anything to add? I think I need to go back and watch RoboCop. <clears throat> <laughs> it's such a good movie. <laughs> no, I, I I mean, it, it'll be interesting to see where this goes. I mean, right. I feel like my mind initially goes to, you know, you probably could build an AI that could take, you know, local crime data and the department's policy. And you could almost tell somebody by their shift, all the things they did, you know, according to policy or, or maybe we're off of what an average officer would do. I mean, it's just... Mm -hmm. At the sky's the limit in a sense. I mean, I can definitely see a more immediate uh, role for it in training. Um, I'm thinking it, it'll probably take a while before it's at the, 
I mean, I, I can see that you'd be able to use it for an after action report, but I feel like now it, it would probably be a really easily implementable and useful tool for training and preparedness. I'll tell you my dream for AI and after action reports. So I talked about a timeline or a reconstruction, and we almost always start with that because you need a fact-based kind of record of what happens so that when you start hearing things, you can compare it to the facts, right? And we build it from emails and from news articles and from um, logs. And when AI is going to do that for me, I'm going to be the happiest person alive, right? It's um, if you could just give it what data you want it to build the reconstruction or the timeline on, and then it could do it for you. Um, that will make me so, so very happy. Um, and then the other thing I think that AI will really be come into play um, is that as we have more, so we gather data, right? Carrie talked a lot about what kind of data we gather, but sensors are going to be gathering all sorts of data at the same time. And they already do, right? People in your hazmat suits, um, if hazmat's in your law enforcement, um, where your EMS is going, kind of there's all sorts of, you know, vehicle data and individual responder data. Um, and there it's sensor driven, right? No one needs to go collect it. It's just there. When we can wrangle AI, to kind of suck that all in and start to use it in our after action reports, I think that's kind of next level as well. That was a great question, thank you. Yeah, I think one more aspect of AI that we'll find is like, right, it's gonna be super great with the data. Um, there will be some challenges with, with language and natural language processing, right, that we're already seeing associated with AI. But what'll be interesting is when AI also becomes an input to the data, when we're taking data from, you know, systems and um, that use artificial intelligence to help operationally make decisions and then looking back into that AI to say, how was that in decision informed by an AI? I think that'll be interesting when we start having that as an input to our data as well. Other questions, feel free to, um, to feel free to take yourself off mute and ask. Um, I will sit in awkward silence for about ten, silence for about 10 seconds and then I'll, I'll pipe in. But um, if anyone in the group has a question, go for it. Don, we did get one question that I think and following up from the references to the um, meta-analysis that um, mm -hmm. you all have been engaged in. Um, what are some of those common themes or issues that you're seeing um, across that? Is there anything that can be shared at this point? Carrie, is there anything that we can share at this point or do we need to wait for publishing? Um, so in terms of publishing, there's a couple things that are coming out. Um, the what, the work we did under the National Public Safety Partnership, PSP, that Tammy mentioned, that'll probably come out sooner than anything else. We took a lot of this idea and proposed it as a research study for the National Institute of Justice and have since expanded that work um, a lot. And we're in the middle of that grant right now. So we've collected um, I don't know, over 100 after action reports from um, mass protests, civil disturbance events, or coding and analyzing them. Can't wait for AI to do that for me. Um, <laughs> and then we're also doing a couple case studies on agencies and how they've implemented recommendations from um, from those after action to see like what recommendations are, are good recommendations and what um, were more difficult to implement and that maybe shouldn't be suggested because the juice is not worth the squeeze. Um, so that is more longer term. Tammy, do you know the timeline, or actually maybe even Vivian, do you know the timeline estimate for the, the quick kind of best practices, that first deliverable associated with the message? I need to put Vivian on the spot. But I don't know. Yeah, no, um, I think probably <laughs> hopefully within the next few months on that, yeah. Um, go ahead. So Carrie's done more than one meta-analysis. Um, she also did one on COVID. Um, I've done one on large-scale um, aircraft um, accidents. Um, you know, Tammy, it wasn't quite a meta-analysis, but it was a larger than the incident you're looking at with the DNC and the RNC. There's so much value in the meta-analysis. I, I can't overstate the value, right? It brings it brings to the forefront um, those issues that um, state, local, tribal, territorial partners need help with, right? So when federal is looking and saying like, well, what can we do to support, right? Those, that meta-analysis brings them up extremely clearly. 
Um, and then also, if you are looking for cons, um, you know, continual improvement, but want to prioritize, well, those things that happen every time to everyone, um, that, that, it's a good good place to start. Um, I I do love me a good meta analysis, um, so I'm thankful for the question. Other questions from the group. All right, I'm going to ask another one, um, but um, put it in the chat if you have one that you were just too shy to say it. Um, I, I want this for all, for all of our panelists. What is an incident that that's occurred in your lifetime? You don't need to tell us what years that was. Um, that you wish you were involved in the critical incident analysis of it, and why? Uh, Carrie, why don't you start? Uh, it's hard to pick one. I'd say every single one that I have helped the agency prior to. So it's, you yeah. know, as that independent organization, we're often handing off our recommendations. And um, sometimes we have a relationship that we are supporting other efforts for them as well. Those are awesome to be involved in because we can kind of help the agency take those recommendations and implement them. But a lot of the times, you know, we're not involved. So if there's ever an opportunity to go back again and look again and help them again, those are the ones I want to be involved in. Um, to kind of turn your question a little bit, there have been a couple that I have not wanted to be involved in. Um, and one actually happened in my, in my backyard. So not my backyard, but in my town. Um, I live in Virginia Beach and there was the the um, shooting, um, the massacre at the in 2019 at our kind of civil buildings. Mm -hmm. And um, there have been a number of after actions associated with that mass shooting. And it was very clear from the beginning that the purpose, at least from the public side of the after action effort, was to find a motive for the shooter and to place blame um, for that incident. And from kind of, you know, an outsider's perspective, because we weren't involved in any of these ARs, it seems like the law enforcement's response was, was good and strong in the city and everything, but the survivors and the families of the survivors of which they wanted you to interview um, really had a different, um, you know, outcome, desired outcome. And this kind of speaks to, to Jeff's point of having preconceived outcomes and desired outcomes that are not achievable. Um, and so I just thought it was kind of not going to be a successful venture and it was going to be very traumatic for the civilians involved. Yeah. But that was one I was kind of, you know, I've been watching, but um, felt like didn't really have the right focus and purpose to it. Yeah, thanks, Carrie. Jeff, anything from your lifetime that you wish you were part of the critical incident analysis? I can't top that answer out of Carrie. I mean, that's like fantastic. Uh, and you actually hit both spectrums. And it, I, 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 I can't think, I mean, there, I, there's a lot that I'd want to be a part of. Um, you know, Carrie, she, you hit it on the head. I mean, we see these, and especially when you know that somebody's vested and they want to improve, and you want to help them. So it's it's like which which one do I pick to say? I really wish you know I I can't think of just one. But Carrie is right. I, I can think of a couple that I won't mention that I wouldn't want to be anywhere near. Um, but back to the same thing, you know, what are those motivations? What you know? How are they coming at it? And, you know, are is there, there are all these preconceived notions, outcomes, and that sort of thing um, that, I, that I wouldn't want to be near that, so. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Um, Tammy, bring us home. No pressure. <clears throat> Honestly, I can't think of an event that, that I, I think I'll, I'll turn it on its head like Carrie did and just say that, you know, hopefully we get to a point where there's, you know, it's an ideal world and there aren't any more critical incidents that need to be reviewed, right? So hopefully like through the work we're doing and once we get a grasp on AI, you know, everyone will be so practiced and we'll be able to focus on preventing all of these, you know, tragedies from happening. Um, yeah. How about you? Oh, that's I'm the question asker, Tammy. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, um, so <laughs> I, I, anyone who knows, so I've been kind of, uh, dabbling in cyber as of late. And I think um, I'd like to get in there with a bunch of the different cyber incidents that happen, not from the why did it happen, because the ones and zeros don't interest me at all, 
but like how it's impacted our continuity and like how we continue to do business. So like all the different cities that have been impacted, the 911 systems that have been impacted, the school systems that have been impacted. I feel like there's a lot of learning to do and how we react when it happens um, that we could be able to um, learn from and pass on, but people are super secret squirrel about that sort of thing. Um, but uh, I, I might have the opportunity to do one um, in the very near future, so I'm pretty excited. Um, but thanks for asking, Tammy. Um, okay, so that is it for our panel. Thank you for everyone who hung in there with us. Um, if you think of questions later and you want to talk to anyone on this team, please reach out to Vivian and the JRI crew, and they can get us in touch um, with you. Um, I put a whole bunch of things in the chat for um, those resources that Carrie mentioned. I put them in in no particular order, I have to tell you, which I apologize for. Um, but everything she mentioned is in there. Um, and so we are at 2.45, Vivian, and keeping with your very strict agenda, um, I'm gonna hand it back to you. Oh, thank you, Dawn, and, and thank you, Tammy, Carrie, and Jeff, for sharing your um, you know, experiences and, and expertise around critical analysis. Uh, so we are gonna move to a 15 minute break um, and then if you would like to um, join us for our keynote speaker, Mary Lou Leary, at 3 p.m., um, you can remain on this Zoom session. So we hope to see you in 15 minutes. Thank you. <laughs>